Welcome back, everybody. Um, this session, Pediatric Emergencies, is being brought to us by um, Jordan Miller. For those of you who don't know Jordan, he started as a first responder, I believe, at Warwick Ambulance um, back in the early part of the century, which makes it seem like he's a lot older than he really is. Um, it was only 20 years ago. Um, went on to become an EMT and then be went to paramedic school and has been working with us as a paramedic for quite a number of years. Um, those of you who do know him know that I have to give no introduction. So Jordan, thank you for your time and um, the floor is yours. Thanks, Chris. So uh, like Chris said, um, I have worked at Warwick um, since 2004. Uh, I have had, um, a lot of educational experience to be able to teach um, this class before. Uh, this class was originally designed to be a two to three hour pediatric presentation, but I had to cut it back to an hour. So I've taken a lot out of it, but I think there's still a lot of really good information that we'll be able to cover today. This class is designed to be incredibly interactive. So I don't have any objection if you turn your microphones off, um, just don't be obnoxious about it, obviously, but if people chime in, it will help this class go the way it's designed to go. Um, so moving on, uh, the objectives, objectives, sorry for this class, uh, we're gonna cover vital signs, the importance of history taking, the fussy infant and tips and tricks uh, if we get time at the end. Um, does everybody here kind of feel comfortable with peds? That's, that's something that scares people a lot of times. Um, as far as taking care of neonates and pediatrics and kiddos, anybody? You don't have to answer. I'll have awkward pauses after questions if people feel like chiming in. Um, <clears throat> but moving on, we'll go over some statistics here. Uh, the most recent national statistics that uh, that are, I feel, accurate to what we're going to talk about were po or pre-COVID. Um, most of the stuff uh, that's coming out now is a little bit altered because of the, the pandemic. Um, some of the numbers coming out are skewed because they incorporate COVID into it. So this is pretty much designed to be pre-COVID. Uh, pediatric visits make up 20% of all visits um, of patients in the United States, 17% of all children in the U.S. Uh, there were... Um, 30,047,000 total visits for pediatric patients in 2015. That's a lot of kids. Uh, as far as how they were treated versus admitted, 29 million of them were released from the ER, uh, and only 980,000 of those kids were released. Uh, I'm sorry, were, were admitted. Um, if you look at this chart, I show the... Uh, the ages that were taken care of, and it's pretty equal across the board. Um, when we look at the emergencies and how they're related to organ systems, respiratory disorder takes up the most, just over 10 million, followed by injuries, poisonings, nervous system, and so down the chart. Um, here's, and there, I have two or three studies in here that were done as far as relating the kids. Uh, these two individuals out of Wayne State University, Howard Beckman and Richard Frankel, came up with a study uh, that 74 pediatric patients visited their office. These were doctor's office visits. Um, 
only 17 of those patients of the visits, uh, the patient provided the opportunity, the provider provided the opportunity to complete his or her opening statement of concerns. Um, so that means only when the doctor walked in the room, um, he introduced himself to the family and only 17% of those parents were able to get across what their concerns were. In 51 cases, 69% of those patients of the visits, the physician interrupted the patient's parents and immediately took over the exam and weren't able to allow the parents to give a full history of those kids. Um, in only one of these 51 visits was the patient afforded the opportunity to complete the opening statement at all. So when you talk about the interruption time that it took for the physicians to walk into the room to meet the parents and that they interrupted them, it was an 18 second amount of time that those physicians gave the parents to talk about what's going on before they interrupted. The, the main takeaway from that and what we're gonna talk about as we move on here is when you're dealing with kids, slow down your assessment, slow down your history taking, um, especially the history taking, because if you interrupt and cut parents off, you might miss information as they're going through. Um, the leading causes of death, as far as uh, pediatrics in the United States, age groups one to four were accidents, unintentional, followed by uh, congenital malformations, and then it's followed by assaults and homicide. Uh, ages five to nine, it's still accidents, unintentional, followed by cancer, then followed by congenital malformations. And age groups 10 to 14, it's still accidents, unintentional, and then it's followed by intentional, self-harm is the most um, prevalent second group, and then cancer follows that. There was another study done, um, which is gonna be our segue into vital signs, by a Josephine Winner out of Albany Medical College. Um, she performed a retrospective chart review. So after the chart was completed and the patients were taken care of, which encompassed a 44 month period of all pediatric patients who were discharged from their emergency department with an abnormal pulse rate, respiratory rate and temperature or oxygen saturation. Uh, the primary aim was to determine the portion of children discharged with abnormal vital signs and the frequency and nature of adverse events. Um, events. So these patients that were discharged to home with one abnormal vital sign, they recorded whether or not there was an adverse event and they needed to go back into the ER or there was a no event and they never saw them again. Um, this is the chart that she came up with. So uh, uh, you see the no event versus event category and then you have the different vital signs. So we'll talk about temperature. As these kids were discharged with an abnormal temperature to home, 45% of them had no issues. They didn't have to come back to the hospital and only 29% of those patients ended up having to come back into the hospital for an issue. Heart rate, it changes to 56% where there was no event and there was 67% that had an event. Respiratory rate, 9% um, of those patients had no event and 17% of those patients did have an event. And then SpO2, you have 15% with no event and 29% with an event. So if you look at the ratios there, respiratory rate and SpO2, if those patients were discharged to home, they were more likely to come back to the hospital with anything else. And so when we go out in the field and we treat these patients, when you're doing refusals, um, because a lot of times we go out for the, the fussy baby, uh, we chalk it up to um, new parents, we're not super worried about it. We say, well, the respiratory rate's a little high, or their SBO2 is a little low, or you know they have a fever, just be cautious about signing those patients off because if you look at these statistics, you know, especially the SPO2, those patients had a high affinity for going back to the ER for an issue. So that's something to be cognizant about. But the issue is as pre-hospital providers or even as providers in the hospital, when you have a kid, and you don't do peds all the time, you have this huge slew of different vital signs that we have to try to remember. Now, a lot of the trucks that we work on, depending on where you work, there's a peds wheel and everybody's got a cell phone. So everybody is able to Google up um, vital signs. And occasionally I have to do it as well. Everybody's guilty of it. Um, 
just like medications for kids. You know, we have a Braslow tea. We, we are trained so much in school on how to treat adults, but when we get to kids, there's this shortcoming of how to treat them, and as, especially as far as vital signs and memorizing vital signs. So this course, we're gonna break it down and we're only gonna cover infants to school age. We're not gonna do neonates um, and we're not gonna do kids over the age of 11. Uh, I have one kid in here that we're gonna talk about that's a little over the age of 11. But as far as pediatrics go, this is going to be the bulk of what we talk about. And you still have this fairly decent range of vitals, right? So like a one month old, the high range of respiratory rate is 55. But when we talk about a school age kid, we're talking about 22 for a high, high end. So as we go through, a lot of this stuff that I'm going to do is, is case studies. And that's why this is kind of an interactive course. So as we look at case studies, we're going to try to learn about the vital signs and how they impact these kids. And then we're going to go through some assessment techniques. So the first case study, we have Camilla. So mom calls 911 uh, at three in the afternoon for Camilla. She's five years old. The primary reason why mom, mom called 911 is because Camilla's out of her inhaler. That's it. Uh, she said she has a little bit of a mild cough, maybe a runny nose. Um, but the main reason that mom called is because she's out of her inhaler. Now, we as EMS providers would be very frustrated with this call, um, but it happens. We all go out for the med refills uh, for adults, and it, it's just as common to go out for kids. Um, maybe depending on where you work, not as much, but the more um, that changes with, with a whole bunch of different factors. But as you go out for Camilla, uh, you start to do an assessment. You notice that um, she's a little sleepy. Uh, you notice that she has slightly dry mucosa membranes, um, so her her mouth is dry. You have her stick her tongue out. Her tongue is a little dry. You notice that her eyes are a little sunken in and dry. Um, she has very clear lung sounds. Uh, when we do vital signs, these are the vital signs we get. So we get a heart rate of 114, and we get an SpO2 of 98%, a respiratory rate of 46, and a temp of 36.6. So. Based off of this assessment, does anybody have any other questions that they would want to ask um, that would lead to a good differential diagnosis? Um, anything on here you see that's super concerning or that you're worried about? What do we think is wrong with Camilla or could be wrong with Camilla? Respiratory. Respiratory rate. Yeah, her respiratory rate's pretty high, right? 46. Anybody else? Questions about maybe what else you would want to know or how we come to a conclusion? She's somewhat dehydrated because of tachycardic. I think, yep, definitely. She's very dehydrated. Um, she's a little tachycardic. She's five years old. So her heart rate's going to tend to be a little higher, uh, but 114's pushing, pushing the high limit. Anybody want to give a differential of what they think is wrong with her? There's no wrong answer. Well, there is a wrong answer, but there's no dumb answer. Respiratory infection with dehydration. <clears throat> I think that's a good way to go. That's a good thought. But we'll go on from here. How about we start asking some questions like, what is her eating habits? Um, what is, uh, how much is she eating? Uh, has she had a lack of appetite recently? Um, what's her fluid intake? We're concerned about dehydration. So then we start to ask questions like, what's she drinking? How much is she drinking? Um, what's her urine output? Questions that start to go down that concern of dehydration route. But as we go along that, every question that you ask on a call has an answer. So you ask a question, you get an answer. And every answer should have another question. Um, as we progress through these calls, we shouldn't be comfortable with either definitely refusing care, um, doing an AMA, or uh, just stopping asking questions until we're confident with at least two or three good differential diagnoses. What's, what's that? What's her pressure and how many times she had her medicine refilled? 
So her pressure's pretty normal. Uh, her medications, um, she doesn't take anything other than an inhaler. Mom just wanted an inhaler because she ran out of the inhaler and she thinks because of the call, she might need it. Uh, my primary thought is what's her blood sugar? Because at five years old, we start to, to see signs. Um, you know, she's super sleepy. She's sleeping all the time. She's super dry. What's she drinking? If you checked your blood sugar, Camille's blood sugar is going to be up over 300. And that's the high, obviously way out of the limit. Um, and that's, that's where we start to see DKA um, and diabetes in kids. So when we talk about a respiratory rate for kids between um, five years old and 11 years old, 20 to 30 is where we want to see it. Obviously, it's, it's relatively the same for adults. Um, but the respiratory rate is what threw me off because I start to think about two small respirations. Um, so we'll move on to the next patient. Uh, so you're called out for Sam. Sam's 12 years old. Uh, parents called because they said um, Sam wouldn't go to school today. Uh, he stayed home from school the last couple of days. Dad thinks he's just being a baby. Um, he's kind of tired of him acting like this. And he told him that if you don't, if you don't go to school today, we're going to call the ambulance. So dad called the ambulance. The ambulance comes out. Um, Sam's been sleeping all day. He did have a recent upper respiratory tract infection. Uh, two weeks ago, he was on antibiotics for it at the time. He finished his course of antibiotics, but he just didn't seem to get better. Um, and which is why we're still at the point where we're sleeping all day. The other complaint is some nausea and minor abdominal pain. Uh, when you do an assessment on Sam, you notice that he is very sleepy. He's very pale in color. Uh, you're listening to lung sounds. They're clear. These are the vitals that you got. Uh, heart rate's 138. SpO2 is 98. He's got a 24 respiratory rate and a temp of 36.8. So just like Camilla, anybody have any thoughts on what's going on or want to know anything else? Appendicitis. That's a, that, that would be a good differential. Um, especially at his age with the abdominal pain. Let's uh, take it for the pain. Uh, Dad said a little bit of Tylenol. Okay. Yeah. What vital sign on there do you see that's that's not good? Heart rate. Yeah. Yeah, heart rate's 138. 12 years old, and he's sleeping. So he's in bed at rest. So 138 for heart rate is way too high. So anybody want to throw, other than um, appendicitis, how about one more differential? Sepsis. Sepsis, good. Okay, so we got two decent differentials that we can work off of. And as we get those differentials, now we go down all sorts of different questioning paths. I put down myocarditis, and this was an actual case study. Um, in kids that are 12 years old um, or teens like this, if they had a recent upper respiratory infection and it progresses for longer than two to three weeks, that predisposes them for myocarditis. And if their heart rate is up over 138, um, that's another possible indicator for it. But this is a good case of why, you know, you don't just buckle at dad and say, he's fine, he doesn't need to stay at home. Because if you fall into that trap and you allow dad to keep him there, you know, myocarditis is going to progress into something much worse. Moving on, we have Lucy. Lucy's four months old. Uh, mom called because she was spitting up. She's had no other recent illness or injury. Uh, and that was really the only reason that she called that she's spitting up. You get there, she appears sleepy. That's really the only crazy thing that you notice with her. Um, these are the vitals you get, heart rate 98, SPA 298, respiratory rate of 34, and a temperature of 35.5. So we're four months old. Heart rate's too low. What's that? Heart rate's a little low. Heart rate is a little low, yep. Who's, who's Googling that temperature of 35.5 to see what Celsius is to Fahrenheit? It's below 30. It's below with normal moisture. It is low. Um, I put I put Celsius in here because it, we are medical professionals, and if you go into a hospital, they do not use Fahrenheit. 
Um, they'll they'll talk about Fahrenheit, but nine times out of ten, when they document temperatures, they're doing it off of Celsius. So Lucy is septic. Um, you have a lower heart rate. Uh, sepsis tends to swing a heart rate high, but when you get something like a cold sepsis, that heart rate can kind of swing a little bit, but the temperature is definitely very, very low. Um, 35.5 is 96 degrees Fahrenheit. So that is a very low temperature for Lucy. Um, Temperature for kids, relatively the same as adults. 100.4 is the high marker for fever in kids, and 96.8 is a low marker. Okay. We have Morgan. Morgan's three years old. Mom called because she's been vomiting for 24 hours. Uh, she's been tired for a little over a week, and she's not sleeping well. So she's constantly saying that she's tired, but she won't fall asleep. When you go out, you notice that she's a little sleepy obviously. These are the vital signs that we've gotten. Anybody have any other questions or they have a differential that they can come up just based off of this? This isn't much to go off as far as of a complaint, but with vital signs and what you have, any thoughts? Some type of infection because her temperature is up, she's vomiting. She's been tired. Well, the temperature is 37, so that's pretty normal. What vital sign is on there that is concerning? Blood pressure. Blood pressure is pretty high. Pressure, yeah. So her blood pressure is 154.88. That's way high for a kid, uh, especially at three years old. So... We have an infection. Any any other differentials? Is your sugar levels? So we get her sugar. Her sugar is right around one eighty. So it's it's on the higher side, but it's not um, in a DKA diabetic range. What what could cause an elevated blood pressure? in a kid like this, in, in this age group. What do you think anything from trying to compensate to some type of cardiac underlying issue? It could be cardiac, yeah, it could be. Um, the case study that I went through for Morgan, it actually turned out that she was in renal failure. Um, but this, this is another ex example of why vitals are important, obviously, especially blood pressures. A lot of providers will say, well, it's a kid that we don't need a blood pressure. They'll just get a heart rate and a respiratory rate and an O2 sat. But you have to be cognizant that if the blood pressure is out of whack, that could be an indicator of something not great. So just, just keep in mind that maybe we ought to be getting blood pressures on kids that we are not getting on kids. Now, as far as determining an appropriate blood pressure, if you take 100 plus their age, that is a decent um, systolic for a kid. 60 to 70 is a, is a relatively safe range for a diastolic. So Morgan's three years old, 100 plus her age, so we're 103 for a systolic, that would be normal for her age. All right, we have another one here. David's one years old, one year old. Um, mom called because David has been sleepy, um, and he also complained of severe dizziness. This is what David looks like when you get to the house, and these are his vital signs. So you have a heart rate of 134, an SpO2 of 99, a respiratory rate of 30, temp of 37, and a blood pressure of 100 over 60. Any thoughts just looking at David? Any what do we notice that might be a little weird about David's appearance? He's very flushed. He is very flushed. Yep. So what 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 do we think could cause severe dizziness and bright red skin? Carbon monoxide or or, or reaction. 
So David has carbon monoxide poisoning. Uh, great answer. Um, the issue is David's SpO2 was 99. And as most of us have been taught, we know that um, carboxyhemoglobin does not attach the same way as oxygen does to hemoglobin. So when we have a pulse ox, we're not going to get an appropriate reading. So when we talk about all the vital signs across the board, pulse ox is, is especially these finger probes, we have to be cautious with, a, with just the pulse ox because you also have to go with an assessment because just because the pulse ox is 99 doesn't mean it's 99. Um, the other thing I want to throw out about these, these pulse oximeters is uh, as nice as they are and as convenient as they are, they are not always right. And especially for a heart rate. Um, I Countless times I've put patients in SVT or I've gone out for patients with SVT and they have these pulse oxes on it and it's saying the heart rate's, you know, 70 when it's 180. So just be cognizant of that. Everybody is probably already aware of that, but that's just a reminder. We have one last one here in this group before we get on to our next section. We have Peter. Um, dad called because uh, Peter was staying over with grandma. Uh, he went to go pick him up. From grandma's house. Uh, Peter uh, is very sleepy. Uh, grandma reported that he was vomiting a couple of times and dad noticed that he was having some periods of apnea. Um, so while he was sleeping, he noticed that that uh, Peter wasn't breathing at times. Is um, grandma missing pills? That is a good question. That is a good question. So as we go along, that's going to be the answer to this. I have a whole other slides that tie into that. Um, but David did take some of Grandma's Ativan, um, which is what caused it. But when we look at um, the next vital sign, which goes over with David, we're, we want to remember that GCS is just as important for adults as kids. Um, everybody here should know their GCS scores. Uh, I don't know that I want to go the whole way through this because we all are familiar with it, but there are other tools that we use for kids when it comes to level of alertness, especially when giving a report to the hospital. Um, what other scales can we use other than a GCS when it comes to kids? AVPU is the first one I think of. So we have alert, verbal, pain, and unresponsive. And another really, really great one is, and I don't know if you guys have heard about this in school or through throughout your experience, but AEIU tips is incredibly um, effective in determining altered mental status in not only adults, but in pediatric patients. And if you run through this list, uh, obviously we're gonna we're gonna notice the poisoning, um, which is what David falls under. Uh, and the next slide I have is grandma. So uh, grandma was the culprit because she had her pills out. All right. So that was going through some vital signs and things to keep in mind. Uh, the next study I want to talk about was done by a sample at the Department of Pediatrics in Colorado. Um, he did a study on 156 patients. Um, when he had these patients come in, uh, he noticed that it wasn't, he was not the physician, he was the, the one that did the study. But of 156 patients, 60% of those patients had serious diagnosis. So when they were trying to figure out the best way to go about determining the differentials or the diagnosis for those patients, 20% uh, of the diagnoses were obtained based off of the history, and 40% were based off of, um, I have these numbers messed up because I was changing slides around. The, the moral of the story with this is that 80, it was 80% were based off of exam for kids, and 20% were based off of history. 
So when we have adults and we go out on calls for adults, um, almost all of our differential diagnosis is going to be based off of history taking. But kids cannot answer questions like adults can, or kids can't answer questions in general because they're kids. So when we are assessing kids, instead of focusing as much on a history, we have to focus on the exam. Um, and when we when we do exams on kids, I am guilty just as everybody else that I've talked to about this topic, that we fall short with a true head to toe assessment on a baby. And especially when we talk about the fussy infant, which is what we're gonna talk about next. Because most of the calls we go out for when it comes to infants is, is just because mom said that they're fussy. Um, most of the people that I've talked to, that's been my personal experience. I don't know what everybody else thinks, but the fussy infant is one of the most common calls that we go out for other than just spitting up, but that kind of falls into the fussiness. When we're doing exams, the physical exam is what's gonna lead us to what we need to find. This is the acronym that I've found to be effective when you are going through a fussy infant and the acronym is it cries. So we're gonna do some case studies based off of this. And then we're gonna go through some disease processes that might um, make you think a little bit about how you're doing your assessments in the field. Uh, the first case study we're gonna go through is Taylor. Taylor's two months old and mom called because she's fussy. That was it. She won't stop crying. Um, she's been crying for uh, greater than 24 hours. I just can't get her to stop crying. Uh, you arrive on scene. Um, right now, she's lying down in the bed. Uh, she appears pretty comfortable. Um, she's not worked up, uh, which confuses you as to why mom called 911 because she said she's crying and she's fussy all the time, but you go out and Taylor's just look, chilling out and she looks okay. These are the vital signs that you get because for me, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, why am I here? If I can convince mom that she's not fussy right now, does she need to go to the hospital prior to vital signs? So you get a heart rate of 130, uh, blood pressure of 90 over 60, SpO2 of 97, a respiratory rate of 26, and a temp of 39.6. Any of those vital signs look abnormal to you for Taylor, who's a two-month-old? Temperature is high. Temperature is very high, 39.6, yep. Does anybody have any thoughts on what's going on? And I'll give you one more, one more hint here. So when you go to pick up Taylor, as you pick her up off of the bed, she starts crying. So you hand her to mom, mom tries to get her to calm down. She won't calm down. Mom puts her back down on the bed and we go back to chilling out, not worried. She's okay. But then as soon as Taylor's picked back up, we're going back to crying. The other thing that you'll notice is Taylor has some of this redness around her cheeks, maybe a little bit of a rash. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna move through the next several slides a little bit faster um, because we're gonna run out of time, I think. But what you're noticing is, is as you're picking Taylor up, she's fussy, but you lie her down flat and she's not fussy. That's actually a, a decent sign of meningitis. Um, kids who are that young cannot identify with neck pain. Uh, so you're not going to be able to ask about neck pain with fever because she can't tell you she has neck pain. What's happening is as you're picking Taylor up, it's relieving the pressure off of her spine and off of her, off of the meninges in the brain, which is causing pain. You lie her down, the pressure is reduced. You pick her up, there's more pressure. That's a symptom of meningitis in kids. This rash that you see on her face, if you notice that rash along with those symptoms, that's something that, that can lead you to uh, a, a bacterial meningitis specifically. Uh, viral meningitis is not gonna show as much of a rash, um, if any rash, but once the bacteria has invaded the back of the nose and throat, um, they kind of travel through the, the bloodstream. Um, as this happens, bacteria, multiply and they produce toxins around the body causing damage to blood vessels and organs. Um, and as the blood vessels get damaged, blood starts to leak into the surrounding tissue, which ends up causing a rash. So when we talk about 
these symptoms that pertains to meningitis. So kids can get rashes all over the place. So I'm not telling you the next time you see a kid with a rash, it's meningitis, but don't just blow rashes off, especially with a fever like that. Uh, so infection is the first part of it cries. Um, we're gonna go through some slides here as far as different infections that are common in kids. Anybody here uh, comfortable or familiar with x-rays? Uh, this is a x-ray of RSV. You see the infiltrates here. That's very common in kids. RSV was really bad this year. I don't know if anybody had it. I had a couple really, really sick kids. I tubed one kid this year with RSV. Um, it was nasty. It's a viral infection um, that can cause, and the, the whole point of this is different reasons that can cause kids to be fussy. So RSV is gonna make kids fussy. Anybody have any idea what this is? Ear infections. It is an ear infection. So when we're doing assessments on kids, a head to toe assessment, trying to figure out why they're so fussy, look in their ears. Ear infection is very common in kids. You go out for a kid who's super, super fussy and they have whistling when they're breathing in their throat. What could that be? Epiglottis. What It could be epiglottitis. With epiglottitis, you'll see a lot of drooling. Um, that's a really, really bad sign. Uh, this is not epiglottitis. If you look at this x-ray, that you're, you're right, epiglottitis is, all, is really nasty and can cause fussiness, but this is also, this is croup. Um, you see the, you can see the trachea as it's narrowing. That's actually what croup looks like on an x-ray. Uh, anybody have any idea what this is? Measles. It is a and foot and mouse. It is hand, foot and mouth. Yep. Uh, how often do we take baby socks off for an assessment? I know that I do not do it as much as I should. And this is a, a good reason that we do a head to toe assessment. When we talk about trauma naked, uh, I would say baby naked, because if you get a baby down to the skin, you're gonna see, you might see things that you don't when they're all bundled and swaddled up. So this is hand, foot, and mouth. Hand, foot, and mouth is a common viral infection. It causes painful red blisters in the mouth and throat and on the hands and feet. Anybody have any idea what this is? It's a rash, uh, obviously, because we talked about rashes are very prominent in kids, but specifically, what else can cause a rash? This is fifth disease. Uh, it's a mild rash called uh, caused by the parovirus, parovirus B19. Um, it's more common in children than adults. And uh, you usually get uh, fifth disease within 14 days after getting infected with the parovirus. Um, but you'll, you'll have other symptoms, not just the rash. Um, generalized flu symptoms is usually what follows. They also can get uh, joint pains is very common uh, with fifth disease. Um, so stiffening of the joints. Anybody have any idea what this is? It's not thrush, is it? It is not thrush. It's a good guess. This is Kawasaki disease. Um, Kawasaki causes swelling in children in the walls. Um, of small to medium blood-sized vessels that carry blood throughout the body. Kawasaki disease leads to infl inflammation of the coronary arteries, which is supplies high oxygen-rich blood to the heart. And Kawasaki disease, you'll get the rash in the hand um, and the feet and the arms, uh, but you're also gonna have, it, it, they call it a, a, a strawberry tongue presentation because obviously the tongue kind of looks like a strawberry. So when we're looking at kids' ears, we're looking at kids' feet, and we're looking at kids' mouths for reasons that can cause fussiness and peds. What's this? Chickenpox. It is chickenpox. I don't need to talk about chickenpox. Now the next slide I'm gonna show is um, of something that we don't check, that we should check more often. Uh, 
I am guilty of it, but this is a very common cause of fussiness in kids. Uh, we're talking about rash, um, pararectal streptococcus, or diaper rash. Uh, it also often appears uh, during or after strep throat um, or, or some type of skin infection. Uh, this is just something to keep uh, an eye out for. So when we're looking at uh, as far as a head to toe assessment on these babies, if they're super fussy and you can't find any other reason, make sure you're looking for diaper rash or some type of uh, strep, uh, pararectal strep. What is this? Mumps. It is mumps. Um, mumps is viral. What is this? Tonsillitis. What would you say? I'm sorry. Tonsillitis. It is strep throat, um, tonsillitis, strep throat, things like that can cause issues. Make sure you're looking in the mouth and not you're just not just looking in the front of the mouth, but you're looking all the way back. Um, flashlights are definitely helpful. What do we have here? Mange. <laughs> this is ringworm. Uh, common fungus. Uh, skin infection, uh, but when we're doing a head-to-toe assessment, make sure you're looking in the scalp because ringworm not only shows up on the chest and the belly and the arms, but it can also show up in the scalp. So pull the hair apart and look in there. Uh, what do we have here? Mosquito bites. Could be a mosquito bite. It could be. What else do we see that kind of ring presentation? Lyme's disease? Lyme's disease, yep. Super not great. So as Lyme's disease occurs, they can cause all sorts of symptoms, but fussiness is one of the first symptoms that a baby's going to show when it comes to Lyme disease because they can't talk about their other issues. What do we have here? Looks like gentian violet's needed. Looks like thrush. It is. It's candidiasis, uh, fungal infection, and it's caused by yeast. So make sure we're looking at the tongue, under the tongue, the top of the mouth, the back of the mouth, the throat, the cheeks. So that's infection. Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is Mary. Um, Mary's fussy. Um, you were called out because Mary, every time you move her uh, leg, she yells in pain. Um, you've noticed a reduction in cognitive skills uh, as far as what mom's telling you and a lack of appetite. I'm going to keep moving along here. Uh, anybody want to take a guess at what, what the issue could be with Mary or where I might be going with this? Traumatic head, head injury. Traumatic injury in general. Yeah. Trauma. Uh, elbow fractures, knee fractures. Uh, the biggest thing when it comes to kids and trauma is that range of motion. Um, as, as you, they're super, super fussy. If you bend an elbow or an arm or a leg, and they get more fussy, that's a good indicator of what's going on. Um, here we have uh, some bruises in kids. Make sure you're keeping an eye out for that kind of stuff. These are almost a, a twisting or a grabbing. Um, cephalohematoma, uh, it's a diagnosis that's based on the observation characteristic of the bulge in the baby's head. This is from head trauma. Uh, it's blood in the periosteum, which is the sheath outside the bones that supplies them with blood. Um, head trauma in kids, uh, you're, you're either going to notice bulging or you're going to notice sinking. Um, this is um, what you would notice as far as bulging goes. And then you have a subglial hematoma uh, is another sign of a head injury for a pediatric patient. Uh, the scalp actually starts to feel boggy. It feels like water or a water balloon. Um, that's another sign of a head trauma to a kid. So things to keep, you're not just looking at a kid, but when you're doing a head to toe, make sure you're feeling the kid because if you feel the head, you, you, we're all taught to check for fontanelles and if they're sunken in or if they're appropriate, but feel all over to make sure you don't feel bogginess or something like that. So now we have Chandler. Chandler is five years old. You were called out for fussiness. Um, 
he's breathing funny is what the the main complaint came from the parent uh these are the vital signs what vital sign doesn't look great here for a five-year-old heart rate heart rate yeah so svt uh svt is not as common in kids um but if a kid's heart rate gets super, super high and they go into an SVT, just as an adult would experience chest palpitations, a kid can't tell you that they're having chest palpitations, so they're going to get fussy. Um, sinus tachycardia and pediatric dysrhythmias is about 50%. Um, SVT is 13%, bradycardia is 6%, and AFib is 4.6. So as far as just with me is across the board. These are the percentages. They're not very common in kids, but you you can end up seeing them. Um, I'm not telling you to put every peed that's fussy on a cardiac monitor, but as you notice a heart rate that's really, really, really high, like Sam, when we talked about earlier with myocarditis, um, just be cognizant that it could be a cardiac issue. Um, again, not super common in kids. Now we have Grady, who's five months old. Uh, mom called for fussiness and vomiting. Uh, fussiness and vomiting, and when I say vomiting, I mean tons of vomiting. Grady's been puking every hour on the hour, all day long. Um, they're feeding him. Uh, he's taking food, but he keeps throwing it up. Any idea on what this could be in a kid? Too much vomit. Pyloric spasm or yep. pyloric stenosis. Sure. There you go, Steve. Uh, pyloric stenosis um, or pyloric spasm. Um, uh, Typically, it's a muscular valve between the stomach and the small intestine that holds food in the stomach until it's ready for the next stage in digestion. Um, the valve is called the pylorus. So when you have stenosis, you have a thickening of the muscles so that it it's becomes stenotic. So when you think about um, coronary artery disease or aortic stenosis, where things become thick and they become... Um, abnormally large, they're blocking food from reaching the small intestine. Um, spasms is where that pylorus is not all the time um, stenotic, but it's spasming, which can cause that. The other issue uh, that, that runs along with a lot of vomiting kids, it could be GERD, um, but we have to remember that when we talk about GERD, GERD is a lifelong um, disease process. It's gastro esophageal reflux disease. So GER, gastroesophageal reflux, is not necessarily a lifelong issue. Um, it can it can come and go, um, but when you get that D at the end, the GERD, it's then considered a disease process. Uh, the next thing that I wanna talk about as far as um, assessments, we talked about looking at skin, skin rashes. Um, I'm not gonna go too far into this, because we don't need to, but trauma, um, anal fissures, um, just be cognizant that, you know, we live in a terrible world and this kind of stuff can happen. So when you're doing an assessment, uh, just be cognizant that that's possible. Uh, and then the next one is into susception. Anybody have any idea what that is? Big word. So intussusception, um, it's, a, it's a serious condition. It's where part of the intestine slides into the adjacent um, of the intestine. Um, this is like a telescope. They call it telescoping action, and it blocks food or fluid from passing through. Uh, it also cuts blood supply to part of the intestine that's affected, and this can become a life-threatening issue. Um, symptoms are all, often very sudden, um, and they're, they're, there's a ton of vomiting, and there can be a lot of mucus and blood in the stool. So when you're asking questions as far as history goes, how's their poops? Are the poops normal? Are they dry? Are they wet? Have you noticed a lot of bloody mucus or anything in the poops? So things to keep in mind when you're looking for that. 
Uh, the next one we're going to talk about is eyes. Um, some people don't do well with eyes. Uh, I know that's a phobia for some people, but we have to talk about it when we're looking at kids. Um, corneal abrasions and ulcers are common. Uh, kids play with things and they can scratch their eyes. So when you're doing a head to toe, make sure you're looking in their eyes because there could be a scratch um, or a blown blood vessel for whatever reason. And the last one we're going to talk about is surgical uh, inguinal hernias um, are, are rare uh, in kids, but it is possible. An inguinal hernia, um, it's in the groin area or the scrotum for boys. Um, and you'll see swelling. Um, it's much more frequent in boys than in girls. Um, and infants who are born prematurely are at, at an increased risk of having this occur. So when we're looking head to toe, keep an eye out for that. The other possibility when we talk about surgical things that need intervention immediately, we talk about testicular torsion. Um, I, have, I have always been the kind of person who tries not to go lights and sirens to the hospital unless it's absolutely necessary. Um, I don't take codes. I don't take MIs. I don't take strokes as long as I'm within an appropriate distance to a hospital going lights and sirens. But this is one thing that I will take lights and sirens to the hospital because as the, the testicles twist and rotate, um, the spermatic cord that brings blood to the scrotum is cut off. And it does not take long for them to lose all ability um, for the testicles to be working in the future. Uh, this is often a sudden and severe onset of pain and you'll notice swelling. So just keep this in the back of your mind. So that goes through It Cries. Uh, I went through that as fast as I could. I have a couple other small things here. Um, as far as tips and tricks go, when you're, when you're dealing with kids, make sure you get down to the level. Kids are scared of adults. I don't know if any of you have ever seen me, but I am a large bearded tattooed guy. And if I walk in and I tower over a kid, I, I look like the troll from any movie. So if you get down to their level, it's a much more personable interaction and they won't hopefully be as scared as you are, um, scared of you, uh, scared as you are, maybe you're scared of kids, but know your crowd, know their language, um, just talk at their level, obviously don't use big words, um, make sure you assess them visually before you touch them, uh, because if you walk into a room and mom's holding her child and the child's just eyeing you up, if you walk over and grab that kid, your ability to do a head-to-toe visual assessment is not going to be great because then they're going to be trying to wiggle to get away from you or get away from the situation in general. So make sure that you're doing a visual assessment first. Um, make sure you're using the parents and be honest with the parents. Don't give false information to the parents because you don't want to scare them. Um, you don't have to be super blunt about everything, but when you're talking to parents, you know, say in the context of um, you see swelling in the groin and you think it's a testicular torsion, don't tell the parents you have time, um, don't be super worried about it, the doctors can fix this, because you don't, A, you don't know the doctors can fix it, because you don't know how long it's been like that, and B, if you tell the parents it's fine, then there's no sense of urgency. Don't get worked up and don't scare them, but just be honest with parents about everything that you're encountering. Um, make sure you're explaining everything and honest with the patient as well. Uh, when you have a child, especially teens, they want to know the truth. They want you to be candid with them. They want you to be honest with them. Um, and don't, don't treat teenagers like babies. Treat a teenager because every teenager wants to be treated like an adult. Talk to them. Um, in a respectful tone as you would an adult. Um, but you have to be honest with them as well, just as the parents, and make sure you praise the patient. Every time a child that you are taking care of does something well, uh, tell them that they did something well. Um, because if they uh, appreciate you and they know that you're appreciating them, the whole experience will go a lot better. So that's what I have for this. I rushed through it as fast as I could. Um, after cutting out a bunch of stuff. Does anybody have any questions or want to go over anything that we talked about so far?
Okay. Jordan, thank you very much. You did a fantastic job. Um, hopefully we can have you back next year or at least at work on Monday. Okay. Uh, if anybody has any questions, you can reach out to Jordan. If you can't get a hold of Jordan or don't know his information, you can get a hold of me and I can pass information on to him. Um, we have a couple of minutes before our 12 o'clock session. So now's the time to get up and get a snack and uh, use the restroom. And we'll see you in a few minutes.